Just look at this image of Gibraltar from space. Let me guide you here. There's Gibraltar, a short outcropping into the Mediterranean Sea. On the other side of the aptly named Strait of Gibraltar lies North Africa. This small gap separates the land, the masses of Europe and Africa. To the west, the Atlantic Ocean, onward to the so-called New World. To the east, the Mediterranean, onward to the Red Sea and through to Asia. Or a full clockwise trip around Africa, back through the Strait, a journey of which Herodotus wrote so skeptically in his 5th century BC histories. With Gibraltar as a navigation point, all things must have seemed possible. Now, who would want to control a place like that? Today we're going to be exploring Gibraltar, starting in the year 500 BCE. We could start further back and we could spend a lot of time in the present too, but mapping Gibraltar's history Neanderthals to Brexit might be a slightly too ambitious project. As a convenient and close point from Europe to Africa and vice versa, Gibraltar has often been first point of invasion, or alternatively, the last line of defense. It had been sieged over a dozen times by the end of the 18th century, but let's keep it simple and start with geography. The main geographical feature of Gibraltar is the rock, towering over the strait at 1400 feet, visible on a bright day from both continents. Through the years, it's been tunneled through as part of defenses. The removed rock used to add just a bit more land for fortifications and development. The eastern side of the rock of Gibraltar quickly drops down to the sea, making that side eminently defensible, but also unlivable. That's why the population is concentrated on the western side of the rock, stretching southward. But but stretching implies a large distance, and that's not what we're dealing with here. The territory itself is a small 2.6 square mile outcropping into the sea, less than a mile wide and around 3.7 miles long. That's six kilometers long and one kilometer wide for those of you who watch Star Trek, the only relevant use of the metric system. To the east is the Mediterranean Sea, and once the known world was widely accepted as extending beyond this sea, Gibraltar became a vital connection with the Atlantic. Because the entrance here is so narrow, there's roughly 15 miles between Gibraltar and Morocco, to control Gibraltar was to control trade. Today, Gibraltar shares a border with Spain on its northern side, or if you're a Spaniard, Gibraltar is the southern tip of the Spanish mainland. Most immediately across the Strait of Gibraltar is Morocco, but it's not just Morocco. To the south lies the entirety of the vast African continent. Gibraltar marked one side of the Mediterranean Sea, so for the ancient Greeks that made it the western end of the known world. This was incorporated into legend. It's said that Mons Calpe, the ancient name for Gibraltar, was one of the two pillars of Heracles, known to us as Hercules. Heracles broke through a mountain, thus connecting the Atlantic Ocean and Mediterranean Sea, and leaving two great steep rocks on either side of his passageway. One rock was Gibraltar, the other on the other side of the strait was the Moroccan peak of Jebel Musa in North Africa. This gateway to the Atlantic was thought unpassable. The ancient Greek playwright Euripides wrote a legend that beyond the pillars of Heracles, no sailor was permitted to travel on the Purple Sea. Here are those pillars of Heracles depicted on an ancient Roman map. On the left of this map would be the Atlantic, on the right the Mediterranean. Gibraltar and Jabal Musa are erroneously depicted as sitting on an island in the middle between Africa and Europe. But this map, obviously, was wrong. The legend of the pillars being unpassable was too. The Phoenicians were the original sailors that crossed this imaginary boundary and flirted with Atlantic sailing. Herodotus wrote that the Phoenicians sailed into the Atlantic all the time, probably not into the open ocean, but on their way to coasts north and south. The Phoenicians didn't settle Gibraltar, but there is archaeological evidence that they did use one of the impressive caves as a shrine, likely wishing for safe passage beyond the pillars. The original Greek name of Culp would fade with time. Its modern name, Gibraltar, came from Muslim invaders in 711. They called it Jebel Tariq, and it's from this name that we get its modern name, Jebel Tariq, Jebel Tariq, Gibraltariq, Gibraltar. To discuss Gibraltar from the time of Phoenician sailors through to the War of Spanish Succession is essentially to speak about the history of the Iberian Peninsula modern-day Spain and Portugal. When Spain was conquered, Gibraltar was conquered. When the Iberian Peninsula changed hands, Gibraltar changed hands. That's not universally true, of course, but in broad brushstrokes, 
it is. The first moment we can take a map and not just place Gibraltar alone as a sailor's landmark, but as part of a larger whole, is at the peak of the Carthaginian Empire. At first, an amalgam of Phoenician city-states dominated by Carthage. The Carthaginians controlled an expanding southern portion of the Iberian Peninsula when Hannibal expanded that into Sagantum and areas bordering the Ebro River. In spring 218, the Second Punic War between Carthage and Rome began. These are the famous years covered by the Roman historian Polybius, when Hannibal marched out of the Iberian Peninsula, cut across to the Alps, and marched down to invade the Italian Peninsula elephants in tow. Rome was oh so close to destruction when they grabbed victory from the hands of defeat. The Romans defeated Hannibal and the Carthaginians in 201 BCE and thus moved into the dominant position in the Mediterranean. In this, they also obtained control of Gibraltar, though it wasn't considered an asset of importance and remained unsettled. Then in 476, the Western Roman Empire collapsed, split into kingdoms and principalities. Many places that had been under the structure of the Roman state were up for grabs. Iberia, and therefore Gibraltar, among them. Enter the Visigoths, a Germanic Central European people who were part of the Romanized world. They, like others, were heirs of the Roman breakup. Pushed westward from modern-day France, they expanded into the Iberian Peninsula in a way that sort of reversed the Carthaginian expansion from south to northeast. The Visigoths started northeast and came south towards Gibraltar. Gibraltar continued on as an afterthought in Visigothic Spain for nearly three centuries, until events that would come to define part of modern Spanish identity, the invasion of the Moors. Before the 8th century CE, we don't have much evidence that Gibraltar was seen as important geopolitically, militarily. Sure, perhaps it had been a likely piece of uh, mythos with caverns for worship, a navigational spot alluded to as the backdrop of a naval battle. But now, in this moment, in the 8th century, someone is going to step on the rock and see it as more, not just a rock a stepping stone. When the Umayyad forces of Musa ibn Nusayr arrived to invade Spain in 710, they didn't immediately arrive on the Rock of Gibraltar. They arrived next to it at Algeciras. They decided eight months later to mosey on over and take Gibraltar itself. The leader of this group was Tariq ibn Ziyad, and as we learned earlier, Tariq forms the root of the modern name, Gibraltariq. Gibraltar, Tarix Mountain. And this is when Gibraltar becomes the stepping stone. The rock became the focal point of the invasion thrust against Visigothic Spain in 711. The Umayyad conquest of the Iberian Peninsula flowed swiftly from Gibraltar to Toledo. The entirety of modern Spain and Portugal became part of what came to be known as Al-Andalus, and centuries of Muslim rule in Spain began. Gibraltar would stay under Muslim control for over 700 years, with a brief pause. And side note, Muslim rule in Spain refers to a lot of entities, borders, constellations before the so-called Reconquest. But let's focus on 711 CE. For the first time, a group, these ascendant Umayyads, gave Gibraltar the once over and decided to create real fortifications to solidify the rock. Though the buildup may have been modest at first, they saw Gibraltar's value as a bridgehead and a defendable position. Though it would be another 300 years before a fort was complete, the work began. The first fort came in 1068. The basic trappings of defense and oceanic traffic were next. In 1160, plans were made for the development of the city and its defenses. Namely, a wall would be created, here's a surviving portion with a later construction, and buildings, for example, a mosque. It's possible the famous Tower of Homage was also constructed at this time. The fortifications of the 11th century were in response to a perceived threat from a resurgent Christendom on the peninsula. There was foresight in this perception. One, because you and I know that a reconquest of Spain was a few centuries away, but second, more immediately, this guy was on his way to interrupt Muslim rule in Gibraltar. His name was Ferdinand IV. There he is again. The artist really flattened, uh, um, flattered him. Ferdinand of Castile took Gibraltar from the north, reclaiming it for Christendom in 1309. Today, this retaking of Gibraltar is called the First Siege of Gibraltar. It remained under Christian control only briefly, surviving the creatively named Second Siege of Gibraltar before falling back into Muslim hands during the 
you guessed it, the Third Siege of Gibraltar in 1333. Now between the Third Siege of Gibraltar in 1333 and its recapture by Christian forces in 1462, there were four more sieges of Gibraltar. They were called the Fourth, Fifth, Sixth, and Seventh Siege of Gibraltar. Now I told you a bit ago that Gibraltar's history would start to look unique, and here's one reason why. It's constantly under siege. This is one of the most siege places in history. Luckily, my imaginary producer has assured me that if we learn the basics of these eight sieges, we'll be good. Done with sieges. Synopses of the sieges on your screen now. After the Eighth Siege of Gibraltar in 1462, Gibraltar was made part of a unified Spain. Between 1469 and 1502, things became official. Gibraltar was under a Catholic monarchy. Non-Christians were expelled from the Iberian Peninsula. This is when the famous emblem logo symbol of Gibraltar shows up, the castle plus key combo, which is prominent on the flag today. Gibraltar was the key to unlocking the Iberian Peninsula. The 16th century is also the point in history when most writers, myself included, stop shorthanding the constellation empires, principalities, and ragtag teams who attack, siege, retreat, or sometimes control Gibraltar as only Christians or Muslims. Additionally, this is the first instance when I've found reference to the, quote, locals of Gibraltar. Before the Moors in Spain, the rock was a place that was visited, passed by, or fortified by professional soldiers. Now, the Spanish were planting the seeds of a town, and therefore, the seeds of Gibraltarian identity. The Spanish weren't unaware that Gibraltar might one day be subject to invasion again, and leadership started adding fortification in the 16th and 17th centuries. Beyond reinforcement, cannons were added, a defensive gate, and the Charles V wall. In a way, all these additions were living out the will of Isabella I, who you see pictured here after learning it was vegetarian paella night. In her 1504 will and testament, she explicitly included a provision on Gibraltar's defense. Quote, don't lose this rock again, guys. Just don't. It's in my will now, so it's probably impossible. Well, the Spanish lost Gibraltar again 200 years later, so I guess it's time to talk about the war of the Spanish succession. Don't let the name War of Spanish Succession fool you. It involves a lot more than just Spain, and Gibraltar played a special role. European power politics in this era revolve around a dude, this dude, Louis XIV. When we think of the all-powerful absolutist king, this guy could be the prototype of the stereotype, all right? He had power, he had palaces, he had ponies and princes and princesses and people prostrating at his feet. King Louis XIV of France was often called the Sun King, and monarchs all around came to model him to test him and often a mix between the two. And in 1700, they came to fear him because they thought he might expand his reach beyond France and into Spain. In 1700, the frail Charles II, Carlos II of Spain, died without a proper heir. The man who was meant to succeed him, Philip, was the grandson of Louis XIV. So this relative of the Sun King of France became the new King of Spain, Philip V. Now, if you're Louis XIV, you look at this situation and you think, Sweet, I've got wigs, I've got some rock and stilettos, and now I've got my grandson as the King of Spain. My influence has grown. What could go wrong? As it turns out, other European powers looked at Louis XIV and France and saw his grandson taking the throne in Spain, and it scared them. At the least, an already powerful France would be in a position to domineer over global trade and conquest with a willing partner. More likely, they feared Louis XIV and Philip V would lump their empires together, creating an unstoppable, giant French-Spanish blob. And to live out this nightmare, to unify this giant chunk of Europe into one behemoth, to begin the Franco-Spanish hegemony, Louis XIV wouldn't even have to send a single soldier or fire a shot. All he would have to do is get along with his grandson. To powerful English, Dutch, and Austrians, this was an uncomfortable possibility. And what better way to deal with discomfort than to send hundreds of thousands of the powerless onto a battlefield? These big three, England, the Netherlands, same monarch, and Austria, allied themselves against Spain and France, charging that another claimant was the rightful heir to the throne. With some provocation from Louis, the War of the Spanish Succession kicked off in 1701. Now, if you'd like an explainer on the lines of succession, a little more context, there's a great video from 
from my old pal Soliloquy in the description. Indeed, there are more details and more players than I can allude to in a video focusing on Gibraltar. The English had eyed Gibraltar for centuries, and so a few years into this lengthy conflict, their eyes turned to the rock after failing at a few other naval objectives. The enemies of France and Spain might have realized earlier that Gibraltar, if taken from the Spanish, could serve as a friendly port of call as well as a base to launch interference of enemy ships entering or leaving the Mediterranean. England Admiral Sir George Rook commanded an allied naval fleet tasked with capturing the rock from Spain. Despite increased land fortifications over centuries, any defense of the rock required supplied manpower with naval backup. The Spanish force there was undermanned and undersupplied. In a word, it was vulnerable. After three days of threats and bombardment, the Spanish governor of Gibraltar surrendered. The English captured Gibraltar in 1704 with Dutch assistance. In a blink, the local inhabitants were now living under an entirely new flag. The town was fairly cleared out by the time the English, soon to be British, took over, so that new Gibraltarian identity we hinted at earlier may have been effectively reset. Ernle Bradford described who came to inhabit Gibraltar in the early years of British rule. Quote, by and large, these consisted of the Moors across the strait and the Jews who, persecuted in Spain, were always happy to take refuge and exercise their skills in Gibraltar. I should note that Genoese and ethnically Spanish were part of the mix too. Roy and Leslie Adkins in their 2018 book tracked down what they called, quote, occasional glimpses of other people of color brought to Gibraltar by Europeans as servants. And just hold your mind on that as we move through the 19th and 20th centuries. Gibraltar was changing. In the bigger picture, the war had stagnated and so there was no unconditional surrender of the Franco-Spanish forces. No victory. That meant the captured territory was in play at the negotiating table as the opposing sides decided to finally bring the War of Spanish Succession to an end in 1713. The fate of Gibraltar then fell into the hands of diplomats negotiating the peace. In the Treaty of Utrecht, 1713, is Article 10 of the Subtreaty, the Treaty of Peace and Friendship between Spain and England. This is what ultimately ceded Gibraltar from the Spanish to the British. The Spanish saw ceding the rock as an embarrassment but as a non-permanent embarrassment. They'd get it back after the next war. No biggie. Indeed, in 1779, Spain formally entered a pre-existing war against the British. The British were preoccupied with a certain American Revolutionary War started in 1775. With Britain distracted and struggling with whatever the Americans were up to in 1776, Spain saw an opportunity. They also had land and interests in modern day Mexico and Florida, so meddling in this part of the world was an attractive option. The French, you'll recall, were already intervening in the Revolutionary War on the side of the American colonists to great effect. But the real reason the Spanish entered the war in 1779 as an ally of France was to recover some losses from the Treaty of Utrecht. And that means to recover Gibraltar. In June 1779, the Spanish laid siege to Gibraltar. This siege went on for over three years and involved tens of thousands of soldiers, skirmishes, sorties, explosions, starvation. It got a creative name. It's called today the Great Siege of Gibraltar. The Great Siege started with a Spanish blockade, both from the north, the land border, and from the sea. The Spanish seemed to believe they could wait out the British. Blocked from all relevant sides, it was only logical to believe that supplies would run low, spirits would drop, maybe then the British flag would too. They weren't totally wrong, as summer of 1779 turned to winter of 1780, supplies did run low and disease did break out. Horse meat was incorporated into rations and medicine was hard to find. All the while, the Spaniards confidently and vaguely shelled at the British from afar. But a new tradition of the Great Siege was about to begin, blockade running. In January 1780, Admiral George Rodney commanded a convoy from England with supplies for Gibraltar. On the way to Gibraltar, Rodney had engaged with a Spanish fleet, handily defeating them. In fact, so handily that when his ships arrived near Gibraltar, the besieging Spanish, having heard about the battle, just gave him space. And then Rodney was able to hang out for a couple weeks, control the waters while other resupply ships sailed in unmolested. Apparently the name Great Siege was like sarcastic. Great Siege, good job. Rodney's blockade run wasn't the only time this happened. A year later, when supplies were low again, a massive convoy led by Vice Admiral George Darby, 
Here he is working out with a resistance band. His massive convoy just sailed past the blockade again. Another time, a Danish ship just got like blown off course exiting the Mediterranean and whoopsie daisy was past the blockade with a bunch of lemons for Gibraltar's scurvy problem. Oh yes, great siege everyone, great siege. Pradia. The sneaking past the blockade continued during the entirety of the three plus year siege. The Spanish never got a handle on it. The climax of the Great Siege was the creatively named Great Assault. Joined by allies, a combined Spanish and French force, well, they exploded a lot of stuff all at once, but they weren't able to explode the British out of Gibraltar. This great assault was followed by the great give up and go home. By the end of this multi-dimensional war, with the United States colonies on their way to independence and struggles all over the map, Gibraltar became a symbol of Britain's fortitude, a silver lining in a pile of losses. And this became a new jumping off point for Gibraltarian identity. During the Great Siege, almost all of the small civilian population had been evacuated. The next two centuries, the 19th and 20th centuries, would involve populating the rock, an inventory item of the British Empire. It had what many have called a distinct Britishness, the Union Jack flying over a diverse Mediterranean civilian population. Genoese, Spanish, North African, Jews, Maltese, Indians, and of course, British. The rock became densely populated. When the surrounding towns became dangerous, as during the Spanish Civil War or during later embargoes, Gibraltarians residing in towns just off the rock resettled back within the secure confines. Though Spain continued, indeed continues today, to covet Gibraltar, it remained, and remains, British. That unique identity persists into the present, with 20th and 21st century referenda confirming a strong Gibraltarian mandate to remain a part of the United Kingdom. The sieges of Gibraltar were over. I hope. <laughs> that means there's just one more spot on our journey. Go to 1940 in your mind for me. After the fall of France in World War II, the United Kingdom expected an invasion of their shores any day. But the Germans briefly considered taking a detour, cutting the UK off from its critical Mediterranean holdings by taking Gibraltar first, before invading the British mainland. By taking Gibraltar, they could easily leap into North Africa, Malta, stretching to the Suez Canal. It was a way of weakening Britain's sea empire by removing a critical juncture. However, Germany knew better than to siege Gibraltar from the sea. The entrance to the Mediterranean was controlled by the UK. So what was the German plan to take Gibraltar? Well, consideration was given to a land invasion of Gibraltar through Spain. The plan was called Operation Felix and involved German troops marching down the Iberian Peninsula and coming into Gibraltar from the north. Adding to the convenience of the plan, there was an old friend of Germany in power in Spain, the fascist dictator Francisco Franco, who had recently won the Spanish Civil War thanks in part to gratuitous assistance from Germany. It was expected that Franco would greet the German soldiers with open arms once more, just as he had done a few years earlier. But Franco had declared Spain's World War II neutrality in 1939. Francisco Franco refused to let the Germans invade Gibraltar by passing through Spain, and refused to do it himself on Germany's behalf. Thus, he prevented the Axis powers from taking the British-controlled peninsula, the lifeline for the Allies in the Mediterranean. But Gibraltar wasn't only a place of intrigue for Axis powers, Gibraltar's docks and defenses played a role during World War II. The docks, which had been updated at the turn of the century, provided extra space and cover for incoming and outgoing friendly vessels. The vast new tunneling created during this period facilitated people and supplies, secrets. The blown out mountain helped provide artificial land upon which the Gibraltarians built a new runway. They planned how they might hold out inside these tunnels for months, even if the city proper were lost. The fear of a land invasion led the defenders to plant mines and add barbed wire. More directly, British ships found haven at Gibraltar in their mission of controlling, defending, and supplying the bottleneck to the Mediterranean. To lose this would have meant the potential of losing access to the Suez Canal and therein the British Empire. Had Gibraltar faltered in World War II, so too would have Britain. Therefore, Gibraltar and its famous rock played a critical role in the largest conflict in human history. We've covered Gibraltar from the Pillar of Heracles to the end of World War II and even touched on some modern referenda. If that brought you value, consider supporting me on Patreon here. I think here. <laughs> Later, y'all.